Spirit of God was very heavy upon us. Uh, now, I, I know, you know, when you get around ministries, there's anointings that you pick up on. Wednesday night, the service started at 7 and ended after midnight. I'm just warning you. No, no, no. <laughs> what an incredible, incredible time, an incredible favor of God uh, that God has given us, and we really just hooked up even to a deeper level uh, in relationship. And God is moving us into a tremendous time and a tremendous season individually as a church and as the body of Christ. Amen. How many are ready to go to a whole nother level? Amen. Now, I have a lot of notes. I, I rose writing pages and pages and pages and pages of notes as Pastor Rodney was speaking, not so much of what he was saying because the Holy Ghost was just talking to me. And now I'm going to talk to you. And there's going to be a breakthrough, layers and levels of breakthrough. Uh, we've been teaching on Psalms 23, but I'm about to get stuck on four words. And I might hang out here for a little while. And I, and I will explain to you why I'm going there, how I got there, and what we're going to see in the church. Going to be a little confession tonight. Is, the Bible says confession is good for the soul. Come on, Amen. Now, don't worry. It's not some what we would call immorality. Amen. But there is some confession. Psalm 23, verse 1, beginning with verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Remember what we turned that word means? I shall not lack. Everybody say, I shall not lack. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters, and he restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, you, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Everybody say, my cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Everybody say, my cup, my cup. runs over. And I, so that says a bunch of things to me, and we're going to really say, we've been understanding that Psalm 23 is a psalm of abundance. And I want us to take back what the devil has perverted and get, so that we can fully get what God has for us. Yeah. See, the enemy will take truths and pervert them and take, get people to take those truths to an extreme in order to cause the real people and the genuine people to back away from the fullness of the truth because they don't want to look anything like the extreme. Come on, amen. You, the holy laughter movement. I mean, God touching people with joy and holy laughter. Man, we saw some incredible things while there with Pastor Rodney. And, we, and you've seen that around the world. And it's genuine and it's real and it's God. But then you get some people who just disrupt every meeting. And even when it's a serious moment and a prophetic moment, they're up there just laughing because every time... It's a learned response. What they learned is when they feel the presence of God, the first time they really felt the presence of God, it turned into laughter. So now they think every time they feel any sense of the presence of God, they're supposed to laugh. Yeah. Yeah. Come on, amen. It's really just a manifestation of in, in, immaturity. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. But then you get some people that, that just laugh, 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 and they disrupt every meeting, and they just carry on crazy, and they just do stuff. We've seen the power of God hit here in, in, in such an amazing way. And you'll get somebody, you know, the Spirit of God will hit him like hit Pastor Greg the other week. And, and he takes off running. He said, I've never done that. But then you get other people because that's what, oh, any time it gets strong, they're going to get out and run. They're going to start plowing people over and knock some old lady down and break her leg. Well, it's the Holy Ghost, you know. Well, that wasn't the Holy Ghost. Come on, Amen. And you see some of that go on, and so then you get a little concerned, and you get a little cautious, and you're like, well, because I, I don't want to look like some crazy extremist. Am I talking to anybody out there? 
Huh? Right? So, so we see an extreme, and then the tendency is uh, we, we do some dimension of throwing the baby out with the bathwater. The tendency is we want to, we so don't want to look like the fake, we so don't want to look like the fleshy, we don't want to look like the carnal, that we back off to a, what we call is a safe position. The problem is that is the enemy has won twice. He's not only won with the person going out there doing the kooky stuff and the extreme stuff and getting him caught up in carnality and not really moving in the spirit. He's also won with the ones that were generally going after God because he got them to back off. Because you will never move in the dimension of breakthrough as long as you have any element of hesitation. Nobody wins the 40-yard dash in the, Olympic tri- in the Olympic races if they hesitate a split second. Come on. Hey, you don't have a world-class home run hitter in baseball because he hesitates. Nobody, nobody gets the realm of breakthrough. You can, you can get up. You can get to 95% and have something that's really, really good, but it's still not breakthrough. It's that last 5%. That makes all the difference. And usually it's that last 1% is where the real breakthrough is. And the devil will do anything he can to get you to not press through to this point in any and every area of your life. If he can get you to hang out here at 95% or 75% or maybe way down here at 50%, or, you know, and some of you all 35% and, you know, and, and then most of the people who go to church tomorrow about 10%. Not our church. Broader, broader church. Come on, amen. Hallelujah. They think they had a hard spiritual day because the latte machine broke down. But <laughs> Come on, amen. Right? So, but the, the breakthrough is at that element of that, that highest level, that high degree. But what happens is the enemy will come in and he'll sow in seeds of, of confusion or whatever because there's always going to be people because of immaturity and sometimes just because of carnality and sometimes the devil himself, there's always going to be people who will take the principles and the truths of God and take him to an extreme. Huh? You start talking about, and when I say my cup runs over, we're talking about in every area of your life. Come on, amen. How many, the joy of the Lord is your strength. We need the joy of the Lord. (laughs) Hey, listen, if you've ever truly been drunk in the spirit, that's great. And I want you to have those times and seasons of being drunk in the spirit. But I I don't want you being so drunk in the spirit all the time that you can't balance your checkbook. (laughs) Come on, amen. Right? So, I mean, uh, you know. But the fact is, what happens is, is we, we keep back and churches do this. Pastors do it all the time. This is, this is a great strategy of the enemy. Holy Ghost begins to move. Then there's a few little crazy things that go on, a few little, you know, uh, stuff that gets a little bit, it seems like it gets a little bit out of hand, and the preachers get fearful, and so they move. They call it strange fire. They get afraid, so they begin to shut that down. The problem is, is they got to be very careful about how you deal with that because if you shut it down and people see you shut it down, then others begin to get afraid of it. And then all of a sudden, you can lose what you really want. And so there's always a balance. That's why I hear sometimes, listen, some people do some things in this church, and I'm sitting there, I'm in, I'm in inside, I'm rolling my eyes. I try not to roll them on the outside. <laughs> but inside, you know, and, and we, we talk about it in staff. We pray about it. And uh, sometimes we send out little, little quiet notices, and sometimes they still go on. There's times we've had to pull some people in and say, stop it. We've had some situations here with just some things. Some of it was just immaturity. Some of it was just teaching. And some of it was just people just, just, just being disruptive. Come on, amen. But on the other side, I don't, wanna, I don't want people being nervous. Oh, I don't want to go too far. The pastor's going to shut me down. Come on, amen. I want you to, I want you to, and listen, when you step, when the baby starts walking, it's not pretty. And they fall down and they laugh. I mean, it's all right. Come on, amen. When people are stepping out and learning the gifts of the Spirit and moving in the anointing, it's not always pretty. It's wobbly. We're going to have some mercy on that too. And that's also another dimension that we need to not sit in the judgment seat and say, well, that just looked a little wobbly. That looked a little strange. Well, give them some, give them some time to grow in it. But don't allow the devil to use that to cause you to back away. 
Same thing in, in every area of our lives. And also in the area of, of, of finances. Amen. Here, let me, let me read the rest of this, and then, well, I'm, 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 and then i got to confess something. All right. Don't react to others' abuse. We say, uh, we say I want it to be real, but that's often fear talking. That's not faith talking. That's fear. To, I'm afraid of looking like them. You're not operating in faith. I'm moving forward in what God has for me. I'm moving forward in the fullness of what God has. No, I'm reacting. Are you all with me on this? So now you're operating in faith. You're not operating. You're not operating in, uh, I'm sorry. Now you're operating in fear. You're not operating in faith. Now, tonight and tomorrow, I'm going to be very, you know, transparent with you because I usually lie. No, <laughs> no, not at all. No, you, you guys, are, I'm like, like, you're way too transparent, you know. So, but I want to be honest with you because I want us to move into this realm of my cup runs over. And I'm going to talk about in every area of your life. I'm talking on, over, over, uh, running over in joy. Come on, running over in peace. Come on, running over in strength. <laughs> running over in health. Come on, running over in wisdom. Running over in anointing. Yes. And let's call it the way we need it. Running over in money. Yes. But I have been so sickened over the years by the abuse of certain ministers that make the, take the genuine promises of God and take genuine things that God has done and they've turned it into a manipulation machine just to get people to give more money to feed themselves. I am so sick of preachers running around wearing $3,000 suits and, be, and lusting over it. Now, I don't care if someone gave it to them, but I've been with them. They hang out and they lust over it. They're wise. I know, I mean, evangelist wise, every town they go into, $2,000 shopping sprees. Every time they go into, no wonder we need a deep offering for our ministry. No, you don't. Yeah, ministry to your wife's problem. Huh? And all of those things. And then it just, I, 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 because what I've seen is I've seen the lust of things. I've seen the lust of power. Come on, amen. I've seen the abuse of people. I've seen the manipulation. I've seen them make promises that God didn't promise. They say, if you give $8,500, you know, God's going to give you peace in your household for a year. Why a year? Because next year we need to raise the budget again. And besides $8,500, if, 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 if you're a... Lord, I don't want to use that word. No, 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 borderlines. I, I, I watch my life. If, Lord, if, you're, a, if you're a dweeb... If you're Steve Martin in one of his earliest movies, <laughs> that's a good one. Uh, <laughs> I don't care how much money you give, dude. <laughs> you're not going to have peace in your household. Come on, amen. So, and when I got into this area, there are down the street, literally, not very far, there are some of the worst abusers, in my opinion, of the message of biblical finances. And I, I don't want to be anything like it. Come on, man. I don't want to look like it. I don't want to smell like it. I don't want to have appearance of it. And when we started the church, I sensed that very strong in the hearts of people because they were coming like, oh, we love the anointing, but we're just waiting for the other shoe to drop. Huh? We're just waiting for that manipulation. We're just waiting for that, that. We're just waiting for that thing. And because I so hate it myself, my wife and I so dislike it, that internally, now I've taught on finances here and I've, I've taught on things, but what you don't understand is when I've gone to the nations of the world, 1991, God spoke to me. And he said, son, I have given you, and you have to understand, from my earliest days as a Christian, I had a disdain for the abuse, but I believed in the biblical principles. 
I started operating in tithing and giving and receiving from my earliest Christian walk. I started watching God bless me and take me. I had no money. And I was going to conferences, more so conferences, four or five times a year all over the country. My tickets would just show up and ways would be paid and meals. It was just incredible. And I watched God do this lifestyle. But I also started seeing some of the abuse. And I, I had a disdain for it. 1991. I remember I was praying and going in ministry, and I had been praying a prayer for a couple years, and I said, Lord, I'll do anything you want, but don't ever make me take an offering. I'll do anything you want, but I don't want to take any offering. 1991, God spoke to me, and he said, Son, I've given you an anointing for financial breakthrough. And I, I said, Now, wait a minute. We had a discussion about this. I don't want to take no offering. And he said, I've given you an anointing. And I'm just sharing this to you tonight, not because I'm going from a big offering. I'm sharing this tonight. So, see, there it is again. Lord, stop it. I'll explain why I just did that. See, I'm constantly feeling like I have to qualify that I'm not like these other guys. Are you all hearing me? But I constantly feel like that's part of what my confession is tonight. I constantly have this thing rise up on the inside of me. It feels like, oh, I got to qualify. I'm not like those the other guys because I don't want to look like them. Come on, amen. I know I'm not like them. Anybody knows me knows I'm cheap. How cheap are you? Listen, I'm so cheap that if I go to an amusement park and we're going to stop and have a meal, we're going to eat fast. Why are we going to eat fast? Because my brain says, why sit for an hour? I already paid like $10 an hour to be in this amusement park. And why take an hour to eat a $10 burger? Because now that makes it a $20 burger and I ain't paying no $20 for a burger. So stuff that food down and let's get on some rides. <laughs> I mean, you ought to see me at Disney World. It's bad. No, we're there. The door, the door opens. We're sending people to this line and running people. Out. Fast pass over here. You get in the line over there. I mean, we got to get it done. I'm going to get my money's worth. It's one of the reasons why in the church we're able to do and, and, and be in a strong financial position. Why? Because, man, we make, it, we, we make everything stretch. So I so just, this, I have a disdain for, for wastefulness. I have a disdain for abuse. So anyways, God speaks to me and says, I've given you an anointing for financial breakthrough. And I said, Lord, okay. I said, under two conditions. <laughs> I negotiate with God. You, you know, you can do that. Y'all looking at me strange tonight. The Bible says, come, let us reason together. I negotiate with God. I said under two conditions. Number one, it's done with the utmost integrity. And I said, number two, people get a breakthrough every single time. Otherwise, I said, I, otherwise I, said I ain't doing it. See, that wasn't the first time I negotiated with God. First time I remember negotiating with God, it was, I was two years old as a Christian. God told me, he said, uh, he said, I want you to start a Bible study for young people. I said, all right, I'll do it under one condition. I said, you have to show up in power every single time. God doesn't mind you negotiating what he already is in his will to do. <laughs> And so we started going around the nation. And I'm telling you, we saw breakthroughs that were just crazy. I mean, everywhere where I went, every, almost every single church I ever, ever went into. I mean, I went to churches that Benny Hinn had gone to. I've gone to churches more Cirillo gone to. I've gone to churches, other big name preachers. Almost every single one. The financial breakthrough was so huge that the, the pastors would come to us and say, that was the largest offering our people ever gave to anybody. And not only that, but place after place after place said, after you left, our tithes and offerings jumped huge. Come on, y'all. Amen? Incredible breakthroughs. 
I moved in just confidence in that. It was an anointing from God. I would, I would do a week meeting, and I'd usually take one night, and I would teach on it, and I'd just, just move in that breakthrough. And I learned something about financial breakthrough. You didn't get it in five minutes. I learned something about uh, moving in that anointing. You know, you, didn't, you generally didn't get it in five minutes. You had to spend a little time. You had to spend time pr- preaching and, and ministering and letting the word and the anointing get inside and break through all of the fear and all the junk and all the preconceived ideas and let that word saturate inside of it and let real faith arise. And oh my gosh, the breakthroughs that we saw were phenomenal, phenomenal. I remember this. I went into New Zealand. Hallelujah. <laughs> I went into New Zealand, and, and uh, we, uh, we were doing a part of these groups, these young uh, people conferences, youth conferences, and every year they would do these, and the biggest offering they ever had was $1,000. They would do a, you know, a conference fee, and then they'd take an offering. It's, it's, it's young people. You would expect not much. And I remember that we were doing two back-to-back ones. And they turned to one of the speakers, and and they said, you do, you do the offering for the conference. And he said, all right. And so I turned to him and I said, don't take an unanointed offering. And he looked at me like, well, of course not. I said, make sure you get the anointing on the offering. He said, was like, okay, whatever. You know, he didn't understand what I was saying. So he went out there, he took the offering, and they were all excited. It was $1,000. It had matched their record. And I, I administered to him for a few minutes about moving in the anointing. They didn't get it. Well, the main guy heard what I was saying, so he turned to me for the next weekend's conference, conference, <coughs> which is another part of the country. He said, will you take the offering? I said, yes, I will. I said, I'm going to take the offering. I said, what's the largest in this one? He said, $1,000. I said, all right. So I, I, I went up there, and that morning I was praying, and the Lord spoke to me and said, it's going to be $16,502. And so I, I got in, and I told him, I said, God spoke to me. Today's offering is going to be $16,500. He laughed at me. He actually laughed at me. I mean, we're talking 16 and a half times the biggest offering ever. So I got up there, and I started teaching on biblical finances. Now, down in New Zealand, they're kind of like in England. They think all's the, all, the only thing American preachers ever talk about is money. So I got up, and I, I started apologizing to him for all the American preachers talking about money all the time. And I had a Bible out, not my Bible, because I knew what I was going to do, but I had a Gideon's Bible out. And I took the Bible out, and I said, I said so, and I just kind of went on this little rant about all the American preachers talking about money. I said, so we're, we're just going to, I wish they would just stop preaching on money and just trust God. And I even got applause for it. <laughs> and so then I went out, and I started reading from the book of Matthew, and within the first few verses, there was something on money. So I said, oh, man, I am so sorry. And I took the page, and I ripped it out, and I threw it up in the air. They were like, ooh. I started reading the top of the next page. It was talking about money. I ripped that page out. I threw it up in the air. I started reading the top of the next page. It started talking about money. I said, oh, I I said, folks, I'm so sorry. I said, well, it is Matthew. He was a tax collector. So I took the whole book of Matthew. I ripped it out, and I flung it in the air. Then I went to Mark, started talking about money. I ripped Mark out. Then I turned to John, started to, or, or, or Luke. And I said, Luke, Luke won't have a problem. He won't talk about money. He was a doctor. <laughs> and then I, I told him, I said, you know, uh, the Bible says that one co- or, or, or theologians say that one quarter of the entire Bible deals with money in some form or fashion. Deals with finances. So I took a quarter of the Bible. I ripped it out. I threw it up in the air. I had this limp hanging Bible there. And I said, now who wants the real gospel? And I I flung it. And it hit the floor and slid all the way to the back. And I mean, people were like, ooh. (laughs) And about 20, there's about 300 people in the building. About 25 people got up and stormed out. They were so mad. Then I took the offering, or then I I taught them on the biblical principles, took the offering, they counted the offering, $16,502.25. And I just wanted to know who disobeyed God and gave 25 cents they weren't supposed to give. (laughs) They couldn't believe it. Pastor, then I talked to him a couple months later. They said our church tithes and offerings jump $5,000 a month, which was about 40%. Jump $5,000 a month from that moment forward. 
So I, next year when I come back to do the, con, do a conf, the conference again, they said, we want you to take all three offerings, for, one for each of the conferences. Yeah, I'll bet. And, and so then the Lord spoke to me and said, you tell them it's going to be more than $100,000 is going to come in. So when I told him on the phone, he just, he just, he, he told me later, he said, I know I saw what God did before. There's no way. It'll never happen. So we get in there and, and uh, first offering was, was huge. It was like $20,000 or something like that. He was, couldn't believe it. Then that was the first offering. Then we went to the second meeting and this is where the breakthrough happened. And I was teaching on, on, on just moving in the anointing. Everybody say Breakthrough. Say it again, say breakthrough. breakthrough. It's that top 1%. Right, right, right. Come on. It's when you move out in faith, no doubting. No doubting. I knew God had spoken to me $100,000. I knew. Now, so you say, well, what do they need that money for? Do you know what they did with that money? Do you know they started hiring full-time evangelists not to work inside their church, but just to run around the country preaching the gospel? Hallelujah. They expanded their ministry so massive. These guys were at the forefront of an incredible move of God down in New Zealand. God used them so tremendously, but they needed the resources to go do it. Hallelujah. So, oh, this is, I love this story. This is so cool because it's amazing. So, so I'm preaching and I'm, I'm moving. I know that I know that I know there's going to be a breakthrough. I know it's going to be phenomenal. And I'm preaching on it and I'm getting towards the end where we're going to take the offering. And the Holy Spirit of God came and stood in the altar. Now, this was a, uh, we were at a, a, at a campground. And this was a multi-purpose room, so it was a gymnasium. And there you had, uh, you know, the three-point line, you know, was on the ground. And where, uh, underneath where the basket normally would be, of course, the basket was removed for the conference, but where the basket would normally be. And this presence of God stood right where the basket would normally be. And the three-point line came right up by the front row right up about here. And the Lord spoke to me. He said, you tell them to bring me offerings, to bring it to me. And he said, nobody is to cross that line except to bring me an offering. And I mean, the presence of God was so strong there, the fear of God. I mean, the fear of God. And so I told him, I said, I just want you to prepare your offerings. Now remember, these are teenagers. This is youth and youth pastors conference. And I said, I want you to prepare an offering and bring the offering. And I told him, I said, no one's across that line except to bring God an offering. I didn't tell him, make him some crazy promise. I didn't say, well, if you give, if you give $85, God will give you your college. Come on, man. I didn't, I, no, I just, this is the principles. See, time and harvest. This is the principles of, of honoring God. Amen. Presence of God was so heavy, so strong. I said, so I don't want us to rush to this. Who, who's ready to do it? I want somebody, one first person. I don't know why I felt led to do that. I found out later. One person said, they're ready. I said, come on up. They crossed that line. They got about two steps past that line and just fell under the power of God. Faith started rising. I said, who's next? Next person got up. They couldn't even cross the line. All of a sudden, I said, as, you, as you're ready, you come sacredly honoring God before God. They started coming one another. Hardly anybody could get into the line. They, they, nobody, got, nobody got within 10 feet of where, that, of where the presence of God was standing. Most never even made it past the line. Others couldn't even get past halfway down the aisle. They were standing back there. They balled their offering up into a ball, and they threw it up there. I, this went on for about 15 minutes, and I said, all right, all right, we got to stop, because they kept coming. I said, we got to stop. They, they wouldn't stop. They wouldn't stop. They started taking shoes off. They started running out to their cars and grabbing valuable things and, and bringing it in. So I commanded them about 30 minutes into it. I commanded them a second time to stop. They wouldn't stop. I was there. I had $800 in my pocket. The Lord said, empty your pocket. God told my wife, Put, give your diamond wedding ring. Come on, y'all hear me? I mean, it was, it was, it was, oh my. I mean, it was God. Third time I told them to stop. They wouldn't stop. Finally, 45 minutes into the offering. 45 minutes, I'm telling them, that's it. The, it's closed. 
You cannot, I command you, stop giving. <laughs> so, <laughs> shakaraba. See, I knew I had no, I had, my notes are no good tonight. <laughs> so finally, prayed the prayer. Presence of God. I mean, it was just so amazing. Prayed this breakthrough prayer for the finances. Then I said, all right, I need some ushers go. Uh, some people help go pick up the offering. Because this is sprawled, sprawled out all over the place. They, they, couldn't, they couldn't stand. As soon as they hit, they fell. So they're crawling around, crawling on the ground, <laughs> picking up the offerings. They, they finally, after half an hour or so, got it all gathered together, took it in the back room. It took them all afternoon to count the offering. Why? Because they said the presence of God was so strong. In the counting room, they said nobody could stay in there more than 10 minutes. They had to leave because the presence of God was so overwhelming. Those children gave, not counting tens of thousands of dollars worth of stuff they gave, but in money, they gave $67,500. Well, somebody give God praise. The testimonies that came flooding in, the young people that were given cars and those that had one, debts paid off and college educations paid for. I mean, it was crazy, incredible breakthroughs. And I asked God in tears, I said, God, why, why? Why was your presence so strong? Why was it? <laughs> yes, I'll tell him that, Lord. Why was it so powerful? And he said this to me. He said, son, when my people give like this, it is the closest thing to laying down their lives that most of them will ever do. Amen. Amen. So I moved in this incredible anointing for years. 2001. That was in the late 90s. Oh, I've got to tell you this part. That had never happened in the country of New Zealand. So the word of that got out through the entire country. Now, it's not a giant, it's a big land, but it's not a lot of people. There were, at that time, 3 million people and 30 million sheep. <laughs> it's true. But, but it went throughout. So when I came back six months later, and I'm preaching throughout the country, I've got some of the top leaders in the country, they came up to me and said, we heard about the offering." We heard about the offering. And then this is what they told me. We heard about the offering. It stirred up our faith. We got to tell you, our offerings have exploded 20, 50, 100 fold one day they used to be. It broke something. See, that's, see, see, in that country, listen to me, guys, in that country, my Lord Jesus, somebody say breakthrough. breakthrough. See, in that country, they had a thing called top, they have a, a, a thing called top poppy syndrome. When they formed that country out of England, mostly coming out of England, they hated the class system in England. So two things they did. They said, well, we'll not have a class system. So if anybody starts popping up too high, we'll cut them down. And two, they hated the power of the church of England. England. So they said, we'll have churches, but we'll keep them poor. Because if we keep the church, this is their philosophy. If we keep the church poor, we keep the church from having power. Are y'all hearing me? So the churches were dirt poor. But God sent me in there. See, I don't, I don't even, I'm, see, you don't even understand. I have that demon spirit, that financial principality that was holding up the finances. He came and visibly manifested in the middle of the night, came into my room and threatened me. And he said, you are not to bring this message to this country. He said, he did. He threatened my family. He threatened, I barely, I've only told two or three people this. He threatened, I mean, I mean, big, big demon spirit, principality, threatened me to my face and said, I, you, I will go after your family. I will destroy your children if you teach this message here. And I said, in the name of Jesus, I bind you and I'm going to release this anointing in this country. And I'm telling you, because of that one offering amongst a bunch of young people, because I moved in faith and a breakthrough anointing, it broke something in the spirit. Yeah. Within two years, that group was, I wasn't even doing their meetings anymore. The offerings were even bigger and bigger, and it was breaking through, and they were doing more for the kingdom. And it wasn't about just the money coming in. It was about breaking that spirit 
And the people started operating in a blessing. Hallelujah. 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 I, no, I don't know if you're ready for this. Come on, someone say the devil's a liar. Their, their money was worth about 38 cents on the dollar to the U.S. dollar back then. And I prophesied, if you operate in this, God will brazen it up and it'll be better than a dollar to dollar, which it is today. No, no, no. Do you understand? The value of their currency is increased. Shakarama. Say, well, Brother Steve, are you taking credit for it? No, God is. But yes, I am. <laughs> Yeah, I am, because I was faithful to do what God told me to do. I was not a bastard. I wasn't afraid of it. They told me you can't do it down here. I said, I'm going to do it. I'm going to preach the word. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. So then a few years later, I got a, another pastor friend of mine down there, wonderful, wonderful man. He was in the poorest area amongst the most poverty-ridden people of the country. And they had about 250 people in their church, and they have been trying to get into a building. They needed $130,000 left to, in order to qualify for this loan. And we had a great relationship. He trusted me as a prophet of God. And he had told me years, uh, over the years that I've been down there, he said, if you ever have a word, just call me for our church. Call me up, and I'll just clear the schedule, and you just come and bring it. Amen. Come on, amen. amen. Thank God for some pastors with some courage. Amen. So I called him up. I didn't even tell him what it was. I said, the Lord's giving me a word. And I said, I'm paying my own way to come. That's for somebody. Man, if you really got a word from God, why don't you? Do you know how many emails, I, phone calls I get and emails I get? I, I get them every week. I get about, oh, oh pastor, God, talk, God get, and they've been, they've been flooding in. No, pastor, I'll tell you, they're flooding in. God gave me a word for your church, so why don't you book me? Fly, pay my flare to come in and give me a hotel and this and that. If you really got a word, why don't you fly yourself over here? Maybe you can bring an offering. Huh? Pastor Cho over there in Seoul, Korea, you want to go preach? Everybody, biggest church of the world, everyone wants to preach for him. If you want to go preach for him, you have to bring a $5,000 offering. People might say, well, that's ridiculous. You know why he does? He don't need the $5,000. He's got a million people at his church. He does that. I want to see if you're really serious to bring, to bring a message to my people or you just want to come and stand on my platform so you can claim fame. Oh, Lord Jesus. I don't know who this guy's preaching tonight, but he's good. All right. We're getting into something. I'm, tell, I'm sharing you stories. But we're getting into something. Someone said the devil's a liar. <laughs> Somebody say, my cup's going to run over. So I, I, God spoke to me to go down and bring a deliverance breakthrough message for finances for his church. Now, I had preached in his church on finances before, and it was the hardest place I'd ever been in the world. Hardest in the world. They were just stiff. He had been taking offerings for their building project once a month, and they were $1,000. 250 adults, $1,000. Oh, but they had a poverty mindset. They'd do bake sales, and they would do, you know, um, yard sales and everything, and they'd raised up $120,000 through bake sales and yard sales, but they wouldn't give money. Huh? So I go in there, and I'm going to preach, and he tells me Saturday night, he says, Steve, he said, now tomorrow's our normal monthly offering for the building fund, so uh, we'll, we'll, we'll do our church tithes and offerings, and we'll do that, and then at the end of the service, you take your offering, you know, for your ministry. And I said, well, I said, as a matter of fact, can I take your offering for the building fund? He was like, oh, all right. That night, God gave me a prophetic word, three-page prophecy. I got down, I wrote, I wrote it out, <clears throat> got up that morning, preached on biblical principles of finances. I read that three-page prophecy, delivered the prophecy. Then I said, now we're going to take an offering for the building. They needed $130,000 in 45 days. They had been taking $1,000 offerings. Are you all with me on the picture here? Okay, poorest people, poorest part of New Zealand. I need you a or. So we're going to take the offering. You either give today or you pledge that you bring within 45 days. Now, pledging over in New Zealand safe. They're not like lying Americans. 
70% of Americans never pay their pledges. Bunch of liars. New Zealand, 100% will pay their pledges. Well, it's quiet now because they actually believe their word means something. So I took the offering. They had them make their pledges out. They started bringing them forward. Again, people are collapsing in the power of the Spirit. The pastor's standing there bawling his eyes out, bawling his eyes out. People are collapsing under the power of the Spirit. All at the altar was just littered. People had to climb over people to bring their offering. We go to lunch. He tells me, I've never felt the presence of God so strong in all my life. He says, I don't understand it. Over an offering. I've never even knew it could be like that. We got into the evening service. Still hadn't got a report how much the offering was. We're in during praise and worship. They come up and they hand us a piece of paper with the offering, with the pledges, and the, and, and the amount that came in. They needed $130,000. $187,000. <laughs> By the time it was all said and done, by the 45 days was up, $210,000 had come in. They got into that new building. They're in that building today. They were in a school. They needed their own building. I mean, somebody say breakthrough. breakthrough. Say it again, say breakthrough. breakthrough. Breakthrough doesn't happen if you hesitate. Even a little bit. Well, I'll give mostly effort. You don't get the breakthrough. It might be good, but you don't get the breakthrough. Come on, y'all hear me. But then God spoke to me, and this is why I'm sharing this with you. God spoke to me at that time, and he said, Son, you have been faithful to bring this breakthrough to other churches to help them get their own their buildings. I'm going to give you your own building. Yeah. 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 Hallelujah. Yeah. And I said, Lord, what is that? I said, I said, what do I need a building for? I was traveling. Come on, amen. I didn't know about the upper room coming years later. I, what do I need? I'm traveling. I don't want a building. I just want to go to the nations. I'll take a little office, but he was talking about a building. And I, started, I said, Lord, what do I need a building for? He started speaking to me scriptures. Turn here, turn here, turn here, turn here. I said, all right, Lord. So I'm turning to places. Every one of them lined up. And one of the places he took me to was in Isaiah chapter 60. And he said, and the gates shall be open day and night. Oh, no, no, no. It gets better than that, though. Woo, hallelujah. Good day and night, shikande. The gates shall be open. Someone say day and night. Day and night. Say it again. Say day and night. Day and night. Woo, but verse, verse, uh, verse 11, therefore your gates shall be open continually. They shall not shut day or night. That, why? That man may bring to you the wealth of the day. Oh my, Sunday cake, shakande. Wait a minute, is there a possibility that setting up a place where you're open day and night, seeking God, praying and worshiping God will cause the wealth of the Gentiles to be carried into your midst? I don't know, maybe there's three of us here just heard that. Hallelujah, hallelujah. And their king's in procession. Kings in Pugola my Sunday. They're going to bring the wealth of the Gentiles. Some say the wealth of the wicked will be transferred into the hands of the righteous. Ecclesiastes 2.26. Now, I'm going to read this from uh, a different translation. It's GWT. I'm not even sure exactly what that. Do you know, Pastor Greg, what that is? It's God's, God's Word translation. God's Word translation. But you got to hear this. This is so good. God gives wisdom, knowledge, and joy to anyone who pleases him. But to the person who continues to sin, he gives the job of gathering and collecting wealth. <laughs> the sinner must turn his wealth over to the person who pleases God. <laughs> oh, I got to read that again. I got to read that again. Someone say God gives wisdom and knowledge and joy to anyone who pleases him. But the person who continues to sin, he gives them the job of gathering and collecting wealth. 
The sinner must turn his wealth over to the person who pleases God. Woo! Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Don't get all upset. Oh, don't, 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 don't buy into the spirit of being mad at the one percenters. They're just out there gathering the wealth for us. Don't get mad when they make all kinds of money. They're just gathering wealth. Oh, Lord Jesus. Someone say the devil's a liar. Say it again. Say, devil, you're a liar. And so I have been free, but oh, I've moved in that anointing for years. I didn't spend, plan on spending time talking about all those experiences, but they raised the level of your faith. But ever since I've been in here, here come confess, ever since I've been in this church, with this church, has been this inside because of the abuses in this region. I've been this, this hesitation, this, 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 I feel like I almost have to make excuses or, or, or over justify or over explain or, or back away just a little bit because I don't want to be viewed as this or that. But we're not this or that. Come on, we got a world to be reached. See, God's people have set an, ex- an expectation level that is so beneath what it needs to be. We've set an expectation level that we're trying to get, just simply get to the point where we're, our needs are met. If I can only get to my needs met, if I only can get up here, the problem is meeting your needs will never reach and, and, and perform reaching the end time harvest. Come on, this is not about you and this is not about me. We have a pro- promise from God. My God shall supply all my needs. Huh? According to his riches and glory. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and Israel. And all these things will be added unto you. I don't have to think one day about my needs. But the devil has got us distracted, spending all our time trying to just get our needs met instead of getting a cup that runs over. Because a cup that runs over spills. And I'm not talking a little, we're talking run it. We're not talking a little drip. We're not talking a little bit. We're talking a perpetual overflow that saturates everything it touches. Someone say every area of my life. Say it again, every area of my life. But I got news for you. See, many of us, some of us in here in this church, we have a lot of faith for the overflow of the touch of God. We have a lot of faith for the overflow of being drunk in the spirit or the overflow of the joy of the Lord or the overflow of revelation. But why do we have such a hard time believing for the overflow of finances? Huh? Maybe it's because we view financial overflow as more carnal than, than revelation overflow. Oh, my Lord Jesus. Someone said the devil's a liar. Huh? John, third John chapter 1, verse 2. Third John chapter 1, verse 2. Shikara mo shande. Shikara mo shande. Whoo! Ha! We're smack, I'm smacking some devils tonight. Shande rebe kara mo shande. Shikara mo shande. Come on, it's time. It's time. Come on, it's time. I said it's time now. Jesus. 3 John 1, 2, beloved, I pray, I'm interceding this prayer, that you may prosper in all things. Someone say all things. And be in health just as your soul prospers. Because that's where the problem comes down. The problem is our soul is not prospering. Our minds are filled with doubt. Our minds are filled with worry. Huh? Our minds are filled with lust. Our minds are filled with lies. Our minds are filled with fear. I don't want to be crazy. I don't want to be extreme. I don't want to be way out there. I'm, a, I'm afraid. I'm afraid. I'm afraid. I'm afraid. But that's the problem. That gets us to hesitate, even if just a little bit, and it removes us from the realm of the breakthrough. It doesn't matter how abusive somebody else has been with the truth of God. It doesn't matter how extreme they've gone. Don't you back away from laying a hold of the fullness of what God has for you. 
Just because somebody speaks in tongues of demons, don't you back away from praying in the tongues of angels. Huh? Just because somebody got up here and started doing backflips doesn't mean you're going to back away from dancing before the Lord with all your might. Huh? And just because someone went out there and took the principles of God about finances and wandered around and wanted to lap themselves with all the bling of, those, of life and drool them and, and lather themselves with the biggest cars, the biggest houses, doesn't mean you need to back away. Because if your heart right with God, what, what is going to happen if God puts 20 or 30 or 40 million in your hands? You're going to be going out there preaching the gospel through other missionaries and through people all over the world. Huh? See, we think that God is trying, that God is sitting back, holding back. Oh, Lord Jesus. That he's holding back, holding back. And almost like if we get so spiritual enough, if we get, you know, then, then God will reluctantly let us have the promises. But you don't understand. He, the Bible says, of the increase of his government, there shall be no end. Oh, you got to get a hold of this. See, if, if we're going to grow as a church, the government of this church has to grow. It's been growing. It's why we have home group leaders. That's an expansion of the government of the church. They're doing a level of pastoring that I can't do with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. Come on, amen? So we raise up home group leaders so they can, so then in a smaller setting, they're able to pray for people. They're able to carry people through. They're able to be there as a support in a way that one person can't do it. It's impossible. So if the influence of the church is going to grow, then our government is going to grow. Now, how does the government grow? Government grows two ways. You must, number one, have people that you entrust with power. And two, you must have people that you empower with finances. Oh, you didn't hear what I just said. Come on, this is good. Come on, you're going to get it. Come on. If a government is going to grow, you have to, one, have people that you entrust with power, with authority. Huh, right? To write to act on your behalf. Come on. And second, you also must provide for them the resources to do the job that you just gave them the authority to do. No government hires, an imp- hires someone to expand the reach of their government and does not supply them the resources because then that's a wasted hire. Come on, you don't get an ambassador to say you're going to be the ambassador to Brazil and then not give them an embassy and not give them a budget and not let them even have the money to fly down there. You, then you, don't have, you only have an ambassador in words. You have no work of an ambassador. If he's going to be the work of an ambassador, you got to give him an embassy. you got to give him staff. you got to give him vehicles. you got to give him money to go out and deal with other dignitaries. you got to give him power. Yeah. Are you all hearing me? Yeah. Someone said the devil's a liar. So in Isaiah, the Bible says, of the increase of his government, there shall be no end. I didn't write it down there, but of the increase of, I think it's Isaiah uh, uh, 9, isn't that right? Of the increase of his government, or 11, or, uh, anyways, of the increase of his government, the Bible says, uh, Jesus, of the increase of his government, there shall be no end. How many believe God is expanding his kingdom? Come on, how many believe God is expanding his kingdom? And the only way he's going to expand his kingdom is, number one, he's got to find people he can trust with power and authority. And two, he must give them the resources they need to do the job. So you're never having to talk God into paying for his his project. Now, you didn't hear what I just said. Come on. You're never having to talk God into paying for his projects. Now, say, say it as we say, I never have to talk God into paying for his projects. Huh? He's not sitting back being stingy. He's not Pastor Steve. <laughs> no, no, no. Come on. He's not back being stingy. He's not looking for, you're going to say, well, I just don't know. He's not holding back. He's looking, he's looking for someone that he can trust with it. He's looking for someone that will do with it what he wants him to do with it. He's, he's desperately looking, can I trust anybody? Like what Leonard Ravenhill said about revival. 
He said, he said one of the reasons we're not seeing real revival in, in America the way we should, and I'm going to paraphrase this, is because Americans are too selfish. Huh? Come on, what would happen, what would happen if someone did drop $20, $20 million in your hands right now? What's the first thing that would pop in most of our minds? What house we're going to buy and what vacation we can go on? Boy, it's quiet now. Come on, that's most of us, that's what it pop on. Not, oh man, here's what I can do with this and here's what I can do with that and here's what I can give. Here's what I can sow. Here's what I, hallelujah, I can empower. See, God is saying I'm looking for people. See, God's not looking for you to go build his kingdom, go build something and then put it back to him and then give it to him. He's not looking you to build and then offer it to him. He's looking you to build for him. Not for him, but for him. Okay? That, that he is sending you out to build what he wants built. So he's de- God is more desperate to get the resources into your hands than you are to get the resources. Now, you didn't hear what I just said. Come on. Come on. I'm going to say it again because it's true. And I mean, whether it's financial resources, whether it's revelation anointing, whether it's a, a prophetic word, whatever it is, he's more desperate to get the resources in your hands. Why? Because he's trying to build his kingdom. Well, what is he really trying to build in this kingdom? What is he really after? He's trying to get a bride. And a bride that is worthy of his son, Jesus. So it has to be a bride that looks like Jesus. So it can't be, it's got to be people first. They got to get saved. Then they got to get raised up. Then they got to get transformed into the image of Christ. Because he's preparing a bride for his son. And we are the bride. And the world is filled with lost and dying people that are supposed to be a part of the bride. And you think God is trying to be stingy with the anointing or stingy with the money? He wants that bride. It is not God holding back. 70 million people a day are joining the loss of the eternity in hell. You don't think God's holding back? Huh? Do you think God's holding back? Do you think he's saying, well, well, you know, I'm just going to hold back. He's got 70 million a day that he, he said it is his will that none should perish. God's not holding back, but he also doesn't violate his principles. Shh. Hallelujah. Makaramo Sunday. Someone say the devil's a liar. Come on, we got to get this breakthrough. Let me read you another scripture, Deuteronomy 28. You all know this verses, but we're going to read them again. Hallelujah. I don't know. I'm not going to do it. No, 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 no. That's a reaction statement. I'm not going to do it. No more reaction statements. Hallelujah. I repented. Huh? I'm going to preach the truth. What if some people leave? More for us. I'm going to get people that want to, do, that, that want to actually change the world. That are not operating in fear, but they're going to operate in faith. They're going to push the envelope. They're going to get the breakthroughs. They're going to stop just trying to spend their entire church experience coming week after week just to get to the point where they operate in what they think is normal. If you will diligently, if you will listen diligently to the voice of the Lord your God, being watchful to do all his commandments, which I command you this day, the Lord will God, your God will set you on high above all the nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you if you heed the voice of the Lord your God. Now, don't come to me and say it's under the law because I, I, lo- I love all that. We all want to claim the promises of the Old Testament but nothing of the negative of the Old Testament. 
That's, you don't understand. This is not a, there's no judgment element negativity here. God's just saying, here's the way things work. Here's the principles of, 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 of if you listen to what I'm telling you to do, then I'm going to give you all of this stuff because it's going to advance my kingdom. The Bible says the secret things, Deuteronomy 29, verse 29, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the, that which is revealed belongs to us and to our children forever. For the purpose of establishing the kingdom. For the purpose of advancing the kingdom. Oh, my Lord Jesus. It actually said, well, I, 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 I get to just keep, stay focused. And all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you if you heed the voice of the Lord your God. Blessed shall you be in the city. Blessed shall you be in the field. Blessed shall be the fruit of your body and the fruit of your ground and the fruit of your beasts and the increase of your cattle and your young of your flock. Blessed shall you be your basket and your kneading trough. Blessed shall you be when you come in. Blessed shall you be when you go out. The Lord will cause your enemies who rise up against you to be defeated before your face. They shall come at you one way, flee from before you seven ways. The Lord shall command. Someone say command. The Lord shall command the blessing upon you in your storehouse, in your bank account, and in all, someone say all, all that you undertake, and he will bless you in the land which the Lord God gives you. The Lord will establish you as a holy people to himself. How's he going to establish you as a holy people to himself? Through his blessing. Oh, my Lord Jesus. Oh, my Lord Jesus. He'll establish you as a holy people to himself as he has sworn. In, if you keep the commandments of the Lord your God and walk in his ways, because his ways are what works. His ways are what works. His ways are what works. My God. See, we think it's because God, lo God loves me, so he should give me all these things. God does love you, but he doesn't release the abundance because he loves you. Jesus turned. Look, Matthew chapter 9. Two blind men came up to him. And when Jesus departed from there, two blind men followed him, crying out, saying, Son of David, have mercy on us. And when he had come into the house, the blind came to him. And Jesus said to him, Do you believe that I am able to do this? And they said to him, they said to him Yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes, saying, According to your love, let it be to you. No? According to your According to your, according to your, according to your. God loves you. God loves you. But you're going to get it according to your faith. Come on, amen. Well, the Lord, the, well, God loves us, therefore he gives us, all, he showers us all his blessings. Yes, but you access him according to faith. You have not because you ask not. And then even when you do ask, you ask amiss. Why? That you may squander it on your own selfish lust. You're asking wrong. You're asking for the wrong purposes. So therefore, you're not operating in faith because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You're not asking according to my principles. You're asking according to carnal things, and that's why you're not getting it. But if you line up with faith, I'm looking for people I can trust with power and with the resources to advance my kingdom. My God. Why do you struggle to believe God to fund his work? Yes. It's his. Yes. I mean, do you go to work for a company and struggle believing them to actually fund the work they hired you to do? Huh? I don't even think about it. I'm just working for him. The guy out there on the street works, building these freeways. He's not wondering every day how the government is paying for this. 
Come on, amen. I got a job. I'm going to go do it. And the bills are going to be taken care of. Somebody say, my cup runs over. Say it again. Say, my cup runs over. It's time we begin to rise to a new level. Let me finish reading this scripture. And I want to share with you one more thing. Woo. Man, I just, I'm, this is, I, oh, Lord. <sighs> verse 10. And all the people of the earth. Deuteronomy 28, verse 10. And all the people of the earth shall see that you are called by, my, by the name and in the presence of the Lord. And they shall be afraid of you. <laughs> and the Lord shall make you have a surplus of prosperity. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're not only going to have prosperity, you're going to have a surplus of prosperity. <laughs> no, 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 no. Let's just go. I'm sorry. Maybe I'm just going happy for a moment. Come on. Someone say, someone say surplus of prosperity. You're not just going to have prosperity. You're going to have a surplus of prosperity. Woo! Glory, 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 glory. See, we've got, to, I've got, we've got to get a breakthrough in our minds. The problem is our soul isn't prospering. That's why we spend so much time here getting you blasted in the Holy Ghost. That's why we spend so much time here preaching revelation and so many times praying, trying to get your mind cleared up from all of these things so you can, your mind can be at peace, your mind can be filled with joy, so your mind can begin to prosper, so you can actually begin to believe God to do what God wants to do. So you stop thinking it's about you. Now listen to me. He's not going to do this stuff because you're so wonderful. Oh, hallelujah. No, that's freeing. Because if it's dependent upon your wonderfulness, some days you're not so wonderful. Turn to your neighbor and turn to your spouse and say, mm, remember this morning? No. <laughs> Come on. Somebody say God forgives. He's looking for people. So, oh my. Shakara. Robert, why don't you come? I got I to gotta start this. So I'm there with Pastor Rodney. Now I'm just beginning. There's so much download revelation God has given me. Somebody say my cup's going to run over. And in a few minutes we're going to pray. And your cups are going to run over. We're not going to stop until your cup runs over and over and over and over. I want the cup to run over so much that you even bother not even paying attention to what's in the cup. Because there's more out of the cup than in the cup. <laughs> Back about three and a half, four years ago, my son Benjamin had seen a news report on these... Uh, websites, these uh, bidding websites where you bid a penny and you can get, you know, iPads for $39, right? Little auctions, quick bid, quick pick options or whatever it is. And he, he researched it, looked at it and said, man, you know, if I just commit to a day, even if it costs me $200 because, because you... You, you have to keep bidding and then it has to go like 10 seconds without somebody bidding and then and then and then who, if it does then you get it well there's all kinds of people bidding on it but I don't forget what the bids are if penny or t 10 cents or something and then it goes up by a penny each or whatever but anyways so it goes on for a while and it can take hours well he had watched a number of them happen and boy they, they closed out quick so he started one eight o'clock I think like eight o'clock in the morning on a Saturday morning spent the entire day bidding bidding Bidding, 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 bidding. Gets up to five o'clock. He has to leave to come to church for worship rehearsal. They still haven't closed. He had now spent two hundred dollars. Now he's eighteen years old at the time. Two hundred bucks, or seventeen years old. Anyways, two hundred dollars. He was mad. He was hurt. He was frustrated. He was kicking himself, mad at himself mainly. If you know Benjamin, just mad at himself. 
just a little softer on that case. And I, I, you know, as a father, I wish he hadn't done it. Come on, amen. But I hurt for him because he was well-meaning. What he was trying to get was a MacBook Pro. And I knew what he was going to use it for. Almost most of it was going to be used for the ministry. That's what he wanted it for, to music and for, for graphic design and things. That's what he wanted it for. And I, I, my heart hurt. But I thought, well, you know, it's a hard lesson to learn. But over the years, I've periodically remembered that. About three or four weeks ago, for whatever reason, it came back up. And I remembered, I told somebody about the story. And immediately, my heart started hurting for his loss. Now, this is four years ago. And God had blessed him anyways. That December, we came into the office one day, and somebody had delivered, given anonymously, a free MacBook Pro. Oh, amen. Actually, to both my boys, both Benjamin and, uh, 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 both Benjamin and Josiah got one. And so that happened. But a few weeks ago, I remember, and I remember my heart just hurt for him again because he had hurt. Then we're sitting there with Dr. Howard Brown, Rodney. He's sharing, ministering, and the Lord starts speaking to me again. And the Lord says, I want you to give him the $200 that he lost four years ago. And I just knew it was God. So I texted Benjamin. And I said, remember that $200? And I had, I reminded him, and I said, and he was in the service for the young people. And I texted him, I said, remember that and whatever. I want to give it to you. Of course, a couple hours later, he texted me back. And he was like, I, he said, I even had to try to remember it. I couldn't even remember it happening. And oh, yeah. He said, well, thank you, but why? And I asked the Lord. I said, Lord, I, I'll do it, but why? And the Lord said this to me. And then God told me to tell you, because I gave Benjamin the $200 today. And he told me to tell you because he's going to release some people here tonight. He said, son, I am having you pay for Benjamin's failure and mistake." Because I pay for yours. As your heart hurts for him, so much more I hurt, hurt for you. Even though it seems small and almost forgotten, I remember it. And the Lord told me to tell you tonight, there are people here, you have made financial mistakes. You have made Maybe it was well-meaning. Maybe it was just flat-out stupid. I know nobody outside of me has ever done a stupid financial thing. And you suffered loss because of it. And God says, I'm going to cover it. No, you didn't hear what I just said. God says, I'm going to cover it. See, you have felt responsible to pay for it. Well, I'm just going to have to, I ha I pay, or maybe you already paid for it. I had to pay, that's the price I had to pay because I made the mistake. You felt responsible. God says, no, I'm going to cover it. It might even seem small to you now and even forgotten, but I'm going to restore what you lost. I don't know if that's for maybe one or two or three people here. I think it's for more. But I'm going to restore what was lost. And some of you were really well-meaning to do it. Some of you were really trying to do stuff for the kingdom to do it. And God says it's not on you. Just like he had me remove it from Benjamin. It's not on him. It's not on you. He, says, he said this, I will not empower you in your rebellion. But I'll pay for it when you're in repentance. Father, we give you praise. I want to pray right now. I want to pray a couple of prayers, but I want to pray for this right now. Everybody sit bowed, nice, close. Father, we give you praise. Did you say, Pastor Steve, that's me? 
I, I mean, boy, you just, it came to your mind. Financial mistake that you made. And it's a price that you paid. And you've, you've carried the burden for it. Now, you've, you've repented for it. You've come before God, you, you, you know, whatever. But you still carry the burden like, well, that's, that's just, I, I had to pay it. I had to pay the price for it because I made the mistake. But God says, you're mine. You're mine. L- look at me for a second. Yes, Holy Ghost. I can't even remember the preacher's name. No, it was a, a, a business owner. Godly business owner. I do not remember his name. Very big business. And he turned to his employees and he said this. I will never have a problem paying for your mistakes. I only require one thing. You take responsibility for it. If you take responsibility, I'll pay for your mistakes. And that's all God's saying. He said, that's who I am. That's what I did in the garden. I just wanted them to take responsibility. That's what repentance is. I've already paid for it. I've already sent my son Jesus. See, if you understand, if you're really his, if you're really his child, if you're really his kingdom, if you're really just a steward, as he says, it was never your money in the first place. Hallelujah. Be free from the responsibility of it. Take responsibility for your actions, but be free from the obligation to pay for it. God will cover it. <laughs> yes, Lord. <laughs> oh, I'm about to forget you all and have a personal revival right myself. Ooh. Hot on my Sunday. Come on, lift your hands say, Lord. I take responsibility for my mistakes, my failures, my actions, and I release it to your hands. But I no longer will carry the burden or the weight of this financial mistake. I receive your restoration. I receive it right now. In Jesus' name. Come on, just begin to thank him. Just begin to thank him right now.